So we're looking at more electricity and magnetism, um, AP Physics C for response questions. This is from the 2002 test. Uh, it's question number one. Um, and we're still looking at uh, arcs of charges or um, uniform charge distributions in a line. So what we've got here is a rod of uniform linear charge density. Uh, we're using the symbol lambda to represent that. Um, it has a value of positive 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5 coulombs per meter, so charge per distance, and it's bent into an arc of radius 0.1 meters. Uh, the arc is placed with its center at the origin of the axis as shown above in the picture. And really, they should probably say this is a circular arc, but it is what it is. Um, uh, for part A here, we are trying to determine the total charge on the rod. So... How can we do that? Well, let's say I don't have any idea of how to do this, other than I know I'm looking for charge. Well, if I look at the charge density, that's coulombs per meter, and I know coulombs is a unit of charge. So that means the linear charge density in and of itself must be the amount of charge I have divided by, well, meters is some length, some length that exists. Now, I used L for length, but you could use S because this is actually an arc length. Um, so what we have here is we've got some length that's going on. And uh, if we wanted to figure out what that Q is, well, let's just multiply by L. So we get Q equals lambda L. So now if I only knew the length of how long this thing was, I could solve it. Well, we do know the length of an arc. Um, if we think back to a circle, you know for a circle the circumference or the length around the circle or the length of the circle's arc is 2 pi r. Now the reason why it's 2 pi is because when you go through a full circle you've gone through 2 pi radians. You've gone through an angle times, well, how far out were you making that angle at? Some radial distance. So we know that this length here it's equal to some distance value, some radial value, times the angle that it's going through. And uh, we have that radial distance value, r, and we have these angles, 60 degrees. Now we need to be a little bit careful here because we're not multiplying by 60 degrees. We're not putting 60 in for that theta, and we're not putting 120 in for that theta either. What we need to put in is the radian amount. And since we're going through 120 degrees or a third of a circle, then the theta value we are actually putting in is a, a third. Whoops. We're putting in a third of 2 pi. So our angle is going to be 2 pi over 3 in this case. So to find ourselves a total charge, we can just say that, hey, our total charge here is lambda times r times 2 pi over 3. And that will give us our answer. Uh, when we go ahead and plug in values for this, the 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5, the r being the 0.1, and the 2 pi over 3 just being 2 pi over 3, we should get a value of something around 3.1 times 10 to the minus sixth coulombs. Okay, and that makes sense. Coulombs is a unit of charge. So we get that there. Ooh, a bunch of pots and pans. Find that. Okay, that means the missus home. Now what we have to do is we need to determine the magnitude and direction of the electric field at the center, O, of the arc. Um, I suggest if you haven't yet, um, go and check out the 2010 e exam, question one. Um, part E of that question is this right here, just with different bounds on it. So we're going to do the exact same thing in that question, but right here. Um, what we're going to do, looking at this, is we need to recognize that, hey, look, all of the field acting on this arc of charge uh, is going to vertically cancel out. 
So all of this field is acting in the x direction, which gives us cosine components because what would be acting at a point here, poorly drawn, what would be acting at an angle here, we're just looking for the piece of it in the x direction because the verticals are going to cancel. Um, so we're trying to figure out, hey, that electric field or the magnitude of it is only the electric field in the x direction and that is the integral of all the bits of field in the x direction and when we say this integral remember that squiggly s that we're drawing that integrand that's just saying we need to add up all of the little bits and what are the little bits of well the little bits the differential components are of the electric field in the x direction so we could write that as saying this is the integrand or the addition of many pieces of the electric field and then the way we got them in the x direction was by saying that this was cosine of theta okay we needed those cosine terms of the triangle if we want to say hey how do i get a tiny piece of an electric field well that means i need to take a tiny piece of the charge that tiny bit of electric field there is given by a tiny little sliver of charge that's sitting right there. And that charge is so small, it's infinitesimally small. So what we can say is that, hey, look, let's add up all of these tiny bits of the electric fields. And the electric fields are given by k. And then traditionally, this would be kq over r squared. But we've got tiny bits of charge. So our tiny bits of charge are going to be dq. So we're going to get dq over r squared. And then here's our cosine of theta term. OK. Now, we can't just go ahead and use this dq. We need to uh, uh, put it into an actual terms of uh, length or some distance measurement. Um, and what that means is that we can go back to our charge density idea. We know that the charge was equal to the density by a length. And if we were talking about for a circular arc, this is like a density times the radial component times the arc you're going through, because that's L right there. So what we can say is that if you wanted a tiny sliver of charge, well, that's lambda times a tiny sliver of length. And that means that's lambda r times a tiny sliver of the angle. So we can take this right here, and that's a really important idea, thinking about these charge distributions, and we can plug it in for dq. So what we get is we end up seeing that this is equal to the integral of k times, and then plugging in for dq, we're going to get, whoa, we're going to get our lambda times r d theta cosine of theta all over that r squared value. Any of the constants in our problem, we can pull them to the outside. So that's going to be our k, lambda, r, and then the r squared. And these values are the same, so we could cancel an r out if we wanted to. Um, for now, let's just keep them there. We'll just see what happens. So if we pull everything to the outside, we're going to get k lambda r over r squared times the integral of cosine of theta d theta. An important thing that any good math teacher will tell you is, what are your bounds? Because what are our bounds here? What's going on? Well, our bounds are through how much of an angle are we going to be moving through. And if we look at this, well, we're going through... 60 degrees and then another 60 degrees. So we could think about that in a number of different ways. Uh, if you want to think about it in terms of uh, um, moving, and there's, there's many correct ways to do this, but what I like to do is I like to say that that's 60 degrees, that's equal to pi over three, because I like putting things in radians, that's just how I feel. Um, or what you could do is you can say, look, if I went all the way over here, this is at like 120 degrees, and that means this is 240 if I go around for my x-axis. Some people like doing that. really doesn't matter. 
Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say that this is my 0, and that here I went up pi over 3, and then here I went down pi over 3, making it negative. Okay, So that's how I'm going to approach this problem. Um, if I do that, putting in my bounds, pi over 3, negative pi over 3, I can then properly run this integral of the cosine of theta. Um, the integral of cosine of theta gives me sine. So when I squiggle over here, I'm going to get k sigma r over r, or lambda r over r squared, times the quantity of sine of theta from pi over 3 to negative pi over 3. And if I want to solve this, I need to take the top minus the bottom. So I'll take those pi over threes and I'll put them in top minus the bottom. So when I do this, I'm going to get k lambda r over r squared times, and then sine of uh, pi over three is high on the unit circle. So that's going to be a square root of three over two. And then we're going to get minus, and then sine of negative pi over 3 is negative square root of 3 over 2 in our case here. And that negative is going to whoosh, cancel that. So you get square root of 3 over 2 again. So what we end up having here is we get a k lambda r over r squared square root of 3. Because I've got two square root of 3's here over 2. Um, and then if I just wanted to clean that up, like I said, whoosh, let's wipe an R out, which gives us that the electric field, or the magnitude of it at that origin point is just equal to the electric constant times lambda square root of 3 over R. Whew. Then we can put numbers into all of it. If we go ahead and put numbers, numbers, numbers in and those numbers we have just from the top again remember that lambda is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5 that r value is just 0.1 and k that's just the constant um, coulomb's constant so we can plug all of our values in there and when we churn that out we should get a number somewhere around 2.3 times 10 to the sixth. And remember, an electric field is a force per unit charge. So that could be Newtons per Coulomb, or if you wanted to write it, you could also write it as volts per meter, okay? Um, and then if you need a direction on this, we could say that, and we've pointed this out before, everything is acting towards the right. So we see part B here, that's the long part. We got all of that calculus that we had to set up to do it. I probably should have given myself a little bit more space. But that part B was only five points for all of that work. Part A, where we just basically found an arc length, was worth three. So we did probably quadruple the amount of work for just two extra points. What I recommend and tell people to do is, hey, if you're doing this, Try to get yourself to the point where you have set up the integral, but don't bother taking it because that's where all the math comes in. Um, if you can get to the point where you just set up this here, you've earned two out of the five points. Okay. Um, after that, all of this by doing the correct integration, even if your bounds are wrong, and then getting a good final solution in orange, and then getting that, that's only worth three points at the end there. That's so much work for just three points. Just one, two, three, four, whoop, boom, you did it. You got another two points, move yourself on. Um, go get some more points somewhere else, okay? <clears throat> for part C, we're trying to figure out what is the electric potential. Okay, um, finding the electric potential at this point is a lot, lot easier than finding the electric fields. Okay, um, one of the ways that 
you can do this is uh, just by setting up real quick uh, the knowledge that all of these points here on this arc, they are all the same distance away from point O, that point in the center. Um, and this right here, this part C here, determining electric potential, this is part you know A or B in the 2010 E&M question one. Um, but what you need to recognize is that if you're looking for a potential, an electric potential is a scalar, which means all of these tiny little bits of charge that we were looking at before, we can just add them up. And since they're all positive, they're all just being added up, we can get the total potential just by adding up all of the bits. Well, if you add up all of the little bits of charge, you get the entire charge sitting on that. So we could just say that our electric potential here, the equation for it is kq over r. And this q right here, that's just the amount of charge on the arc. Well, we know the amount of charge on the arc. We found it in part A. So just take your part A answer right here, come downtown, shove it in for Q, multiply by K and divide by R. When you do that, you get an answer of uh, around 2.8 times 10 to the fifth. Naturally, our units of the potential or volts or the voltage is volts. Okay, But we can do that because voltages or these potentials are scalars. You can just add them all up and all of these charges on this rod are sitting the exact same distance away because it's a circular arc. If you have a linear straight rod, that probably gets a little bit harder because now as you move through each point across the rod, you get further away and that value of R changes. And that makes it a little bit trickier of a problem where we do have to do a little bit of calculus there. But in our case here, nice circular arc, boom, we're golden, okay? What's up, Bill? Um, so now we get to do is we get to place a proton at the center there, um, and it's held in place. And then what we're trying to do is figure out the magnitude and direction of the force that must be implied to keep the proton at rest. So if we look back to this picture, this entire arc is positive. So if we put a proton here, the proton's gonna try to run away. So our force needs to act to the left, okay? So we at least got the direction right, you know what I mean? Like we can just say it's the negative x-axis or to the left, or you know, if you're thinking cardinal directions, you can say west. That right there is a point. So if we just go down here and we don't have any idea what we're doing, but we're just saying, yeah, that force has got to be left. You just earned yourself a point because you figured that out. Okay, you said, look, the proton's going to move to the right. If I don't want it to do that, I got to push it to the left. Point. Get the easy points. The easy points are out there. Just go find them. Okay. Actually finding this, well, if we know it's going to be moving to uh, the right, well, what force is it going to be moving to the right with? Because we just need to balance that force and they'll cancel out because they're vectors and then we're good. So what f amount of force is actually pushing to the right? Well, if we go back to that idea of the E field that we found, the E field is an idea of a force per unit charge, which means that when we write our force equation, we can say that force is or charge sitting in an E field. The charge we've placed there, that's the proton. And we know the charge of a proton, just the fundamental charge, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th. We've found our electric field previously, so we can just dump them in. Even if we got that electric field wrong initially, or even if you didn't have a value for the electric field initially, just dump whatever you have in. Okay, or just say it's the electric field from before. You might be able to score a point from that. They might just be looking for continuity. So in our case here, we've already gotten our point for just saying left, ding, let's just work this out. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th. We bring our electric field down from before, which we found it to be 
two point uh, what was it two point six two point three times ten to the sixth. Oops, come on. Two point three times ten to the sixth newtons per coulomb. This is coulombs. Coulombs cancel, and we end up getting a value for our force of being a very very small number. It's just three point seven times ten to the minus. 13 newtons okay and that's acting to the left or west or the negative x direction whatever um for part e the proton is then released so you're holding it there ah i can't move and then you let go and boom it moves away um describe in words its motion a long time after it's released so this is a big one they're asking you to describe in words now if you've been taking either ap physics one or ap physics two You've been describing things in words your whole time in physics. But if you're just taking AP Physics C, we tend to just math things and leave the words to the English majors, right? But we need to use our words here. So there's a few things that we can say in its motion after it's released in a long time, so an infinite time, after it is released, okay? So what we can say is that well, initially after it's released, and even a long time after it's released, we can say that it's moving to the right. Okay, it's moving in the positive direction, positive x direction, or it's moving east, or it's moving to the right. So it's moving to the right, which could be the positive x direction, or we can say that's east. So that's something we can say about it. That is a part of its motion. Okay. Now, if we think about this particle moving away from this, and if these are the only two things in space, then it's initially going to move quickly away with a large force, but as it gets farther and farther away from the arc, that force is still there, but the force is less. You're farther away, the force is decreasing, so you're still moving, and you're still speeding up, because the force is still there but that force pushing you is becoming less and less. So what you can say is, you can either say that the acceleration is decreasing or going down, because the acceleration or how much this particle is speeding up is going down because it's feeling less force. Or another way to say that is if the acceleration is going down, that means the velocity or the speed of the object, because we're only in one direction here, is approaching a constant value. And in the 2010 uh, question that we've talked about a few times here um, for e &M number one, this is actually a value we calculate in one of the parts of the problem. Um, this velocity is not going to zero. It's not slowing down. It's got this positive arc here, and it's a positive charge. It's always being pushed away. It's never going to slow down here, okay? Um, so the velocity is not approaching zero. It's approaching some value. And we cannot just say that it has a negative acceleration because it doesn't have a negative acceleration. It's being pushed to the right, which we've kind of called the positive x direction, by the way the diagram is. And that acceleration isn't opposing the motion, the acceleration is just becoming less. It's like you've slammed on your accelerator in the car, the pedal, and you pull back on it a little bit, but you're still speeding up. You're just not speeding up as quickly. You have a less acceleration, okay? Um, interestingly enough, part E here, that was two points. So just by saying, hey, look, it's going to the right or the east direction or the positive x, that was a point. And then saying that the acceleration is decreasing or that the velocity is approaching a constant value, that was another point there. So you got two points just for basically saying how an object was moving. You got a point up here just for saying, I need to place a force to the left to keep it from moving. So just talking about how a particle is moving got you three to the 15 points. You got a fifth of your points just from picking directions and saying, eh, it's still speeding up, but not as much. The calculus, which is a giant thing, that only got you five, okay? So don't worry about the calculus. Worry about what you know. Um, solve what you know. Solve the math that's there for you. 
If you can do the calculus, great. But once again, my recommendation is hit that spot in the calc, jump onto the other stuff, get those free easy points that you know you can answer, and then go back to the calc and spend your time on the integrals after you've looked at all the problems, okay? With that, this was the 2002 uh, Electricity and Magnetism for Response. Question number one, and it is finished.